The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Let me say a little bit about the course. We all have views of evolution. You've all taken high school biology. Uh, you, you know, you've all been uh, exposed to a set of concepts. It's a very broad set of concepts. It connects in many, many different ways across the culture. But fundamentally, evolution is a scientific subject. And, you know, people who work in evolution sometimes are amazed at all the religious controversy because it's basically a scientific topic, and uh, so we'll, we'll talk about some of these questions. But uh, it should be an area that you're all coming to MIT, you all should have opinions and you all should have uh, some exposure to the set of ideas of evolution. All right, so a little bit about the course concept. Um, Darwin is a key figure. And as you all know, he's associated with evolution. And sometimes people think, oh, evolution is Darwin. But uh, that is not my view. Darwin was one of the most important exponents of a approach to evolution that was developed in the 19th century. Tremendously important figure. But evolution as a topic has been around for centuries. And evolution connects to many, many different science uh, fields. And uh, so Darwin was the chief exponent of natural selection in the 19th century. But evolutionary thought uh, can be traced all the way back to Aristotle, many, many figures uh, from the past. So what we will do in this class is we're going to trace some of these ideas with the notion of trying to see how the basis of evolution was established through various speculators in the history of ideas. My bias in this course is a little more history of ideas, maybe, perhaps, than literary history. I mean, literary history is uh, one of my areas of expertise, but uh, I'm particularly interested in looking at this topic through the history of ideas because there have been many speculators who have talked about things related to evolution, and so those are the figures I will be examining. Uh, and the way the course is designed is we'll look at some pre-Darwin thinkers. For example, David Hume, very, very important philosopher of the 18th century, and Hume was a speculator about uh, miracles and a whole range of topics related to uh, the way in which the world may have come into existence. Hume is sometimes seen as a skeptic, but uh, he actually, the book of his that we will read will provide three different perspectives on how the world came into existence. It's a wonderful dialogue, a set of dialogues. Uh, so we'll also, uh, we'll also read uh, Thomas Malthus his essay on population. And that's a tremendously important work, one of the first big works that uh, put together a sort of uh, a statistical approach to thinking with the cycles of life itself and came up with a theory about the difference between the way in which uh, production could be increased and the way in which populations uh, uh, increase in the fact that there was a differential. So we'll look at, the, these are, are pre-Darwinian thinkers. Um, so we will look at some of those people. We will then, uh, we will have a big unit on Darwin and uh, we will read a pretty big chunk of The Origin. Uh, that's, uh, it's a great book. It's, it's a bit of a challenge too to read for modern people. Because it's, it's, it's a scientific work, but it's not written the way sci science is not done this way uh, today. Science is done in you know, papers and shorter presentations. So 
it'll be it'll be a bit of a challenge. But uh, I have lots and lots of material on it, and we will really get into the into the core of uh, Darwin's origin of species. Really try to understand it as a book, and what Darwin was up to. Uh, then we were then we will read a bunch of post-Darwinian figures, people who were influenced by the Darwinian view of the world, and uh, wrote works of literature speculation, all sorts of interesting science fiction, all sorts of interesting material that uh, flowed out of Darwin's thinking, uh, or not necessarily flowed out of his thinking, but was influenced by his thinking. So we'll look at Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which is a very famous work, and try to understand that from a Darwinian point of view. What, what was Stevenson, how, how was Darwin, Darwinian thinking influencing that work. Uh, and then we'll finish with a unit uh, actually on feedback theory and, 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 and modern views of machines and machine thought. Uh, one of the questions we will explore in this class is, can machines be made to think? Could machines think? So we will look at uh, a number of controversies that emerged out of, uh, out of the, uh, in, in the 20th century but we're based in evolutionary thinking. And we're going to look at uh, one of the key figures we'll look at is uh, Norbert Wiener. And uh, we'll read one of his works. And he was a very important thinker on contemporary uh, feedback theory. He was, he was an MIT professor, actually. Very colorful and important uh, thinker. Uh, so we'll, we'll read his work and we'll look at Turing, uh, some of Turing's uh, papers on uh, the Turing test and machine uh, intelligence. So at the end of the course, my hope is you will see how all these different topics are connected organically together into a whole set of questions. Uh, this is a class, as many humanities classes are, about questions. It's not necessarily a class about answers. Uh, I don't have specific answers. Uh, I'm not here to promote one view of uh, evolution or religion or anything like that. I'm here to ask the questions and to get you thinking. Uh, and, you know, I really don't care what your ultimate uh, uh, view of the world, uh, it, 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 what it emerges as uh, or what it is. I'm not here to change that. But what I am here to do is uh, talk about evolution and sort of think about it as a, a whole system and uh, ask interesting questions about it. So, okay, any, uh, any questions here? Let's talk a little bit about uh, some of these uh, early, early questions. So this is a class that has design in the title. What do we mean by design? What is design? MIT is a place that design is all over the place. It's like uh, everybody talks about design. So what does the word mean? Because anybody, can anybody come up with a definition of design or, or, or describe something about design? Yes? Um, design is, I think, how the things we see yeah. are the way they are because Someone designed them like a higher being. Okay. So now okay. Like the idea of a god or okay. someone who designed everything. Okay, that's one concept of design, a sort of uh, theological concept of design. Absolutely true. That's one way in which people use that word. What about the word itself? What does what do we mean when we say design? Yeah. I think it has a lot to do with the, the planning involved before the creation. Okay. And what about, uh, how does that, uh, how is that consistent with design over in course two, mechanical engineering? Well, that they would, I guess, carefully plan out how the machine works, what they want to make it do before they actually make, okay. make it. Okay, so there's some kind of uh, intention involved, some kind of planning ahead of time. Anything else? Okay, so implementing something. Any other? Yes? Um, I think sort of creation with a specific purpose in mind. 
if you don't just blindly start designing a machine to have something that you want to do. So. Okay. Yeah, those are some key words out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a purpose. Uh, so purpose is usually associated with the concept of design, isn't it? Uh, the classic definition, or one classic definition of design is just adaptation of means to ends. So an end is something that you're trying to accomplish. You have a set of means. I mean, what about all the contests that get done in, uh, over in course two, you know, where people design, you know, uh, they, they're given a certain amount of material and they have to carry out a certain task. That's a classic design situation where there is a, a goal and you have a certain set of means and you adapt those means to the goal. So in design we have this concept of uh, purpose and it's a very, very important part. So how does this relate to these two figures here? The left one is uh, a deity creating the world. It's uh, from William Blake's, uh, one of William Blake's works. And right, we have Darwin sitting here as a young man, very uh, quiet and looking out and staring at us. So how are these two figures uh, related to concepts of design? A couple of people said already, creation of the world. Why is a world uh, associated with design and the concept of, uh, you know, creation with a purpose. What is it about the world that leads to that sort of thinking? Yes. It's constantly changing. Whether you believe in creation or evolution, <coughs> um, the world is constantly adapting to what's happening around, like mm -hmm. humans specifically, I guess. And, okay. and Okay, so the world shows the ability to change or things in the world change, and what's, what's peculiar about the change? What is it about the change? It's getting Okay, so there seems to be some kind of uh, uh, goal that is being achieved in these changes, is there not? So what else about the world leads to these notions of uh, uh, a grand designer? Yeah? The fact that it's so complex and so unique, uh, could, could this come about without an intelligent designer? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the more we learn about the world, the more incredible it is, isn't it? I mean, when we really study closely the phenomena of the world, we see patterns and you know adaptations that are just kind of incredible. I mean, you find insects that are perfectly adapted to the uh, other organisms they feed on their their limbs and everything. I mean, you find this this constant uh, process of, uh, in fact, of adaptation in the world. So when you step back and you look at the world. It's a fairly complicated, but nevertheless, it's full of purpose, isn't it? I mean, it seems so. It certainly is full of adaptation. And of course, adaptation is one of the big topics of evolution. Things get adapted, and amazingly well. Worker bees, I mean, think of them. They don't even reproduce, and there they are. They're creation, they work together collectively to support the hive, and how did that all happen? That kind of complexity in human behavior. The world, um, there is a purpose in mind, but the purpose itself is really vague when you compare it in terms of human design, and I think human design, um, this concept that the world is designed is, if you look at the past, um, the history of man, all technological progression is very intentional with a purpose. But, so, once again, it seems improbable that the world was just, okay. like, just came about randomly. Okay, so you're, you're really making a, an interesting distinction here. And one is, humans seem to definitely have this kind of purposive process where they have needs and they develop tools and implements. I mean, 
who, who, who can fail to be impressed with, you know, the, the early implements of early humans, you know, how ingenious they were, you know, capturing fire and doing all sorts of things with uh, the primitive tools they had and learning how to interact with their environments too. And that's very impressive, the, the record of humans, just the, and, and their ability to design. But then you mention the outside world itself, humans didn't design, and yet it also shows patterns and designs. And I think that's the same thing. There's also, in the outside world, well, if you, if you go by Darwinian thought, mm -hmm. like the ultimate idea is what is better, not necessarily <coughs> what achieves a certain purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any further comments on the outside world and design? What was Darwin's contribution to design? I mean, how did Darwin get, uh, how did his work approach? What, what, what realm was he primarily interested in and how did he approach this concept of design? Why is evolution at the center of the discussion of design? Is a plausible theory for the design of the current world that is accepted by the many. Because Darwin came up with some new approaches to the concept of how design might take place in natural in organisms, uh, in, in, in the organic world. Darwin came up with some new approaches that in which a designer was not necessarily the agent of the design. And this threw a big wrench into the whole discussion. The sort of conflict of terms in Darwinian language, which we'll find. But uh, where a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the original work in, in, in Darwinian, Darwinian thinking was uh, around this concept of uh, how could these patterns and adaptations uh, emerge in the world without being put there by some individual intentionally? But through a natural process of uh, interaction with the surroundings of the world. <clears throat> so this was, a, this was a very great problem. And uh, Darwin came up with some approaches to thinking about design that uh, really changed the way in which we use the term in the natural world. And thus, humans and their very direct purpose of way of designing was seen as somewhat separate from the natural world in the way in which design emerged in the natural world. But uh, let's have a look. Okay, let's go to this. Okay, so this, uh, the, the, one of the key questions in, uh, in Darwinian thinking emerged uh, around the question of can there be design without a designer? And here you see some very natural implements. You see work from uh, Leonardo's uh, great uh, sketchbook, uh, gears and cogs, and, and, then, uh, and then you see a simple shell design. You see two patterns of two approaches, two kinds of design here? What's the difference? Okay, so we have uh, a, a type of design that emerges from the natural world and we have a human, a thinking human coming up with concepts of designs and, and patterns. Yes? Wouldn't everything, like, we can't, like, why, why do we distinguish ourselves from the rest of the natural world? Like, put a like, barrier in between saying, like, oh, we okay. think that they do are natural, and what we do is not natural. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. That's a, I mean, certainly, if, if what we say, uh, if humans are pr product of the natural world, then whatever they do is, is in some sense a natural product, is it not? So are there differences? 
how do, how do humans change the formula? Do they change the formula at all? We, I mean, we don't have to say it's unnatural to design a chair to sit in, because we can say, well, this is a, uh, do humans do anything different? What, what, what do humans bring to the, to the whole process? Okay, a purpose. What is the purpose in the design of the shell? Okay. A home for the creature inside. All right. So did the creature design it, or? So you see, we come up into some uh, in, in in this area. We come up into a big ambiguity, and that is, uh, we have natural designs, but we don't necessarily have an author for them, who actually built the thing just like it was. We can refer to a process and say, well, these emerged through you know the interaction of millions of years of uh, development and so on and so forth. But so whereas in the human we have a, as you say, self-conscious intentional purpose and to, to build something with a certain effect. Now the point of whether one's natural or one's artificial may be, you know, not that important. But the process that humans, humans kind of speed up design, don't they? I mean, think how fast humans, uh, I mean, just think of the, the rise of the car, the automobile, how fast uh, that all took place, period of a couple of hundred years. So human design tends to iterate, does it not, very quickly and uh, reproduce itself and improve itself and so on and so forth. So there's a very definite design process that you're all here to study whatever your respective field is. You're probably in, involved in some aspect of design, whether you're you know, designing a polymer or you're designing a new kind of material or you're, you know, I mean, we, we design, MIT is a center for design, but it's this very intentional, deeply informed type of design. In, in the natural world, how does design take place? What is the scale of it? Sorry? Survival of the fittest? Well, that's one of the, uh, we'll explore that later in the term, we'll come, yeah. Uh, but I, I'm sort of thinking just in, in terms of the time scale for designs to emerge in the natural world. Uh, yes? Um, well, the time scale, depending on whether you're thinking about like planets themselves or just Earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so part of what happened in Darwin's time was it became clear that um, uh, from geological study that the Earth was really very, very old and not just a few thousand years old as some of uh, the earlier speculators had thought. So Darwin had millions of years to work with when he began to think about his system. And of course with millions of years and many, many different uh, changes, many, many different generations, very tiny shifts in one direction could add up to huge uh, changes over a couple of hundred thousand years. So Darwin began to expand into this huge time scale that geology had given him. And we'll look at that a little more closely when we get to the Darwin unit, because geology was really one of Darwin's first areas of interest. But now he had millions of years to work with then he could begin to think of incremental changes that would add up to tremendous uh, adaptations. So human design is always, uh, we always think of it in a very collapsed, tight time scale, whereas natural design we think of in the terms of emerging through eons, thousands, millions of years. Okay, so those are a couple of things we can say. Uh, one of the problems of using the word design is, uh, can we really use design for these shells? I mean, in what sense is design the right word? Is a snowflake, can we say a snowflake is, is, is design? So this word design is, it gives us a lot, of, a lot of difficulty, which is good because it makes us think about the question. But 
What about the ap applying this word design to snowflakes or, or natural? Yeah. Well, um, if we like define design as you know, something towards a purpose, and like what you said about how the animal doesn't design the shell, then the purpose is more so adapted by the user <coughs> than it was designed. You know? Okay. Like the purpose of the shell was only granted by the animal that used it. Okay. I think I'm getting that. Yeah, so what you're saying is uh, purpose really, are you saying purpose is just an individual thing in these or that it doesn't exist? Um, I don't know, I, I guess in my mind there's just kind of a divide between like, like, uh, just like cognizant like animals and users mm -hmm. and just like Something like a shell, it's like almost a, like a mineral formation, like a geological yeah. formation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, like a pattern. Of, yeah. So is there a difference between designs and patterns? I think so. I mean, patterns are certain, there are regularities in patterns and so forth, but we don't necessarily uh, assign an intention to them. Nobody intended. Yes? is that uh, when we think of design from like a human perspective, we have our, it's purpose driven, where yeah. you have a purpose first before you design it, whereas with the shell, it, the purpose is more applied to the finished product. Okay. Oh, here's a shell. I think I'll use it as a home rather than I need a home, so I'll build a shell. Okay. So the purpose comes after the whatever it is. Okay. So that's, uh, that's in a case where something acquires, uh, but if, if the shell is, the object is the is the organism. Uh, we wouldn't assign purpose to that organism in creating its own shell, because uh, it didn't do anything intentionally. It, uh, the the shell simply exists, and so this is a this is an ambiguity. We oftentimes assign purpose to patterns when we don't really mean it. I mean, we say, you know, my, my computer is giving me a lot of trouble, or my computer is, you know, we don't really mean that the computer is doing something intentionally. So there is a, there is a way in which humans assign the word purpose, uh, the concept of purpose to designs where, just for a kind of a shorthand. We're going to explore this problem. This is, a, this is a very, very big problem. And nobody's ever really solved this, uh, you know, made a really clear way of uh, coming up with this, this concept of uh, applying design to natural objects. Well, I guess we're, uh, are evolutionary concepts ever applied to like non-living things? Non-living things. <coughs> uh, there have been some special cases, but generally not. Uh, evolution is um, seen primarily uh, as a phenomenon of life. And uh, it's a remarkable phenomenon because uh, when humans discovered that life forms changed, this was, this was really big news. I mean, this was kind of uh, astounding because people thought basically the forms had been put on the earth and they were that way forever. What happened to make people think forms changed? Well, that was certainly a classic example of it. Yeah, people People began to discover, uh, I mean, there were lots of speculation about changing forms, and certain early thinkers uh, actually detected uh, certain types of changes in, in living forms. But the discovery of fossils and older forms began to really change people's concepts of what existed. When, uh, when Darwin traveled to South, uh, South America, I mean, he, he found fossils in a lot of the geological areas he studied. And, uh, you know, these were of organisms that didn't exist anymore. So, you know, people had to come up with some kind of explanation. Uh, some people thought they were monsters from some ancient uh, time or something like that. There were all kinds of theories about how to explain the fossil remains of the earth. 
And that was just one area, but there were a number of areas that began to change people's way of thinking about uh, life forms and their change. Okay, so, well, we're going to come back to the concept of design, but it's really central to what we're trying to explore in this course. And the ambiguity is what I'm interested in, because we have this kind of play of the word design, and we apply the word design to natural objects, but we don't fully mean that they were that individual object was intended to be exactly as it is by some maker. Now we have a lot of ways of thinking about that, but we'll explore some of those. And Darwin, of course, had to deal with that. Okay, so uh, one of the things that I think is important for our study is, is just sort of the understanding a little bit about the concept of nature itself. Uh, how we talk about nature and what nature is and the environment in which we live in. And uh, so many of the works uh, we're going to be reading uh, explore these, uh, this, uh, reflect different concepts of the natural world. Uh, and in Darwin's time, probably the leading uh, view of the world, or one of the leading views, because, you know, there are many different elements and aspects to every culture. But one of the, one of the dominant views, uh, certainly in educated circles, was the sort of romantic view of the world as, as uh, 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 the romantic image of nature itself. And uh, I'm going to ask you to read a, a short poem uh, in a minute, but uh, this was one of the famous, and, and it's set at this location. This is uh, an abbey. And, uh, it was a uh, uh, abbey in England that William Wordsworth uh, visited, and on the occasion of his visit in uh, 1798, he actually wrote a very famous poem that reflected some of his concepts of, of the natural world and memory and some other elements that uh, we'll talk about in a minute. But I just want you to think about this uh, this relation of design here in this picture. Look at these, what's happening in this picture, this painting. This is a painting by uh, uh, Edward Days, and uh, it was painted a little bit before the time that Wordsworth visited. But what do you see in this picture uh, uh, that says something about design? What kind of design do we have here? We've been talking about artificial and natural designs. Yeah. It seems like nature kind of modified the abbey that humans designed and mm -hmm. those bigger lines go. Okay. Yeah, there's there's something going on here, isn't there? It's uh, uh, a I suppose an architect or an engineer would say, Well, that's a serious case of wear. <laughs> this this ancient abbey that uh, was designed uh, by some masterful architect and built is falling apart. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a sort of, it's a, it's a ruined abbey. It's a, it's a, it's a, a church structure, a, a structure designed to uh, you know, give shelter, to make a statement about uh, uh, views of uh, religious views, uh, it's, it's, uh, and it's put on the earth. And yet, over time, the earth gradually is taking it back. And, you know, eventually there won't be anything left. So we see the intersection of, uh, and we could say the natural world is uh, also a world that reflects design. So this comes back to this kind of ambiguity between human design, your point, and you know, if we're humans, we're part of the natural world, and the fact that everything that gets designed ultimately wears down, eventually collapses. So humans are in this constant kind of uh, uh, tension with the natural world, as are all individuals. The natural world reclaims itself. Yeah. So, is it that nature kind of has 
its own way. Like if we say that the flourishing of nature is kind of a type of design, then wouldn't there be like a clash of designs? Like isn't there a clash of designs between nature's design and like human design? Um, like say, suppose we design something for our purposes, no. but maybe this design is hindering the progress of somebody else's design. And if we let it sit and we don't use it anymore, someone else's design might decide, oh, OK, I need the space back. And so I'm going to, I guess, design and grow over it or something like that. And so there's like constant conflict between different designs. And so like maybe there aren't just one type of design, um, but many that are com like competing to, mm -hmm. I guess, survive or something. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the sort of uh, human artificial uh, objects? Yeah, I mean, there are many cases where old abbeys were taken, uh, the stones were taken from them to build new structures. And so, uh, and space is always something that, uh, you know, people build something on it and then somebody else comes along and wants to build something different or something bigger or something newer or something. So yeah, we're, we're constantly sort of in some kind of conflict even with our own designs. Uh, but all of our designs are also in conflict with some natural process out there. We have a few minutes and I'd like to pass out uh, William Wordsworth's poem and uh, <coughs> have you read it over and maybe we'll get a few minutes to talk about it a little bit here in class, too. This is a, a, a very important poem of William Wordsworth's. Its uh, title is Tintern Abbey, in which he... Uh, uh, it's, it's a wonderful poem. It's a beautiful poem. It's, it's written by Wordsworth uh, <coughs> on a tour to this location of uh, Tintern Abbey. And it's a poem of memory uh, about his sister Dorothy, but also about just his relationship with nature and how he viewed nature and the human relationship to nature. So if you take, uh, let's take 10 minutes and see, if you, see how far you get in this poem. And we can start talking about it and then we'll come back to it next class. Okay. Um, you can, uh, I mean, you can't read a poem like this in 10 minutes, but uh, I'd like you to read it over, over the weekend here. But uh, what can we say about this uh, view that uh, Wordsworth is expressing in here, his view of nature? And what does his view of nature have to do with Tintern Abbey? He doesn't really talk about the Abbey too much, does he? What, what, what's Wordsworth interested in here? What, what's he talking about? Sorry? Okay, so uh, his, con his, his, his response to nature is what? How? Uh, obviously, he's, he's a deep admirer of natural, the natural world and nature itself. What are some, what are some other things that he, what are some things he says about it that uh, captured your attention? Yeah. Loyal, judging from that quote on the slide, he okay. describes it as loyal commitment to. Okay. He feels his relationship to nature is a kind of um, uh, a very uh, spiritual and trusting and uh, sort of uh, a, a sense of the incredible. Uh, uh, sense of well-being he feels in natural environments. So that, uh, you know, there's this very, very powerful mood in the poem itself, is there not, about just being in nature. I mean, you must, do any of you have, I mean, what's your, I mean, do you have similar types of responses? Some of you go hiking or go out into the world. Uh, <laughs> do you, how do you feel about being in nature? And is that similar to what Wordsworth feels? Yes. He mentioned that it seems like some people, it feels like they're running away from something bad as opposed to running towards something good. And he feels like he 
what even like bad things that happen in nature, it's just driving him towards something good. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like he's really positive. Yes, he, he certainly, his, his, he has a very beautiful, uh, capacious sense of nature itself as being a place to, that is, is uh, humans are intimately related to. And, you know, in some sense humans uh, are of nature. They come from nature. And there is a, there's a, a sort of sense of uh, the benignness and support of natural forms. He distinguishes between his youth and his older, later years. Yes? Yeah, about how um, he, like, the older he gets, the more beautiful nature gets. Yeah. And so he really, he, really, he really didn't understand it when he was a younger boy, but when he keeps coming back to it, he appreciates it more and more. Yeah. So his relationship with nature is ever evolving. It sort of, uh, it, it evolves in his sense, yes. So he, uh, he speaks of, uh, you know, he says in, in uh, line 65 down here, uh, uh, or just start uh, at about line 60, and now with gleams of half-extinguished thought, and with many recognitions dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. So his mental process is really important here. This is a, this is a poem partly about the mental process of interaction and the, the spiritual process in the, in the mind, being in the mind, the life of the mind. The picture of the mind revives again, while here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years. And so I dare to hope, though changed, no doubt, from what I was at first, I came among these hills when, like a roe, I bounded o'er the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. For nature then, the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal moments all gone by, to me was all in all. I cannot paint what I was. The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms were then to me an appetite, a feeling, and a love that had no need of a remoter charm, <coughs> of a remoter charm, by thought supplied nor any interest unborrowed from the eye. That time is past. This is the shift. That time is past, and all its aching joys are now no more, and all its dizzy raptures. Not for this faint. I nor mourn uh, nor murmur. Other gifts have followed for such loss I would believe, abundant recompense. For I have learned to look on nature not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt the presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and the mind of man, a motion in the spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought and rolls through all things. So what's, what's he talking about here? What does he find in nature? Yeah. It seems that nature encompasses man, no matter how hard man tries to impose its design on nature. It will always envelop. Yeah, it's, it's, it's capacious. It's, it's the source. It's, it's the ultimate source of uh, what we are. I mean, we can't divorce ourselves from nature, or we shouldn't. Does Wordsworth feel that sometimes humans do divorce elsewhere in the poem? He sees that uh, there, there's a kind of conflict in them, is there not, between being in nature and what he calls the, the sort of the, 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 the tediousness of urban living. He sort of sees uh, the, the, the country versus the city, the urban versus the wild, is definitely something that uh, is a conflict that emerges in, in this, this work.
but he sees in nature what else? Not just the source of our existence and our being. What else is infused in nature? Um, like being, being in a uh, tranquil state of mind and feeling like you're part of a whole rather than feeling like you're an individual. Hmm. Certainly that, certainly that. Um, tranquility. This he sees a scene, he's looking down on this scene from above, not, not this perspective, but from above. Uh, but he sees this, this tran tranquil setting, little smoke puffs coming from the trees way down below. He's on some cliffs above. But he sees, he sees even more than that in nature. Yes? I think he's sort of comparing, um, when, when he compares how he saw nature before to how he does now, yeah. um, before he just took it more superficially that it's beautiful, it's nice to look at, yeah. it's there. And now it seems that he's more comparing things and seeing how everything is interconnected. Yeah. Yeah, he sees the texture, the organic quality of the interconnectedness of things in nature. And he identifies him as part of that, himself as part of that. He feels akin to that. He feels embraced by that. But he also sees in nature some kind of a force, does he not? I mean, what's he talking about here? Who's, who's, uh, 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 he says, uh, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns. What's he talking about here? I mean, what is the argument for the spiritual quality of nature? This is, uh, or argument, what is the, you know, what is, how does this emerge in Wordsworth's poem? I mean, nature is not just a set of objects in which he relates to beauty as forms, but it has more, does it not? Yes. Well, probably, yeah, I mean, designer is probably not what he has in mind, but certainly a spiritual force, a spiritual essence in nature itself that he identifies with. And he doesn't have a name for it. You know, you could say, well, maybe he's a pantheist, or maybe he, you know, we could put labels on Wordsworth, but that would be missing the point of the poem. It's, it's this sense of that, there's a, there, that there's a larger force in the natural surroundings that humans have come from that can be discerned or detected or felt if you allow yourself to become part of it. So this is, uh, this is, a, this is a, a tremendous source of uh, sort of, um, I mean, Many, many romantics explored these ideas of, you know, where, where does the spiritual center of the human existence dwell? Where is it? Where, how can it be found? How can it be touched? How can it be seen? How can it be f felt? And Wordsworth is, is a poet in chief on this. I mean, he's a tremendous... Uh, is a tremendous sense of the powers of, of, of nature. Uh, it is true, the view of nature he has. Uh, well, what, what kinds of, uh, na I mean, what nature is he talking about? Where, where is he seeing his, where is his nature? Yeah. and the wild, yeah. that can be really dangerous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the Huxleys wrote an wrote a essay once called Wordsworth in the Tropics. <laughs> he said, well, you know, in essence, you know, the, the tropical nature is, uh, is also beautiful. And, and Darwin had the same uh, phenomenal experience when he 
first visited the tropics, he just, he, on his voyage of the Beagle, he wrote about how he was just kind of uh, drunk with the beauty of, of being in these dense tropical forests and butterflies and things, you know. However, <laughs> there are things that uh, eat you too, where there, 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 there are negative forces out there, so it's not always, uh, not always benign. Uh, and uh, Wordsworth is, of course, writing really not so much about a wilderness concept of nature as more pastoral nature in the pastoral sense. Uh, and this is a nature that's, you know, more or less inhabited by humans. There are little puffs of smoke coming up through the trees and so forth. Whereas, you know, there are many places and spaces in the, in, in, in the world where what we would call nature is uh, tremendously hostile and, um, you know, foreboding. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily uh, a place that you can assume is going to be in, uh, a, a place of uh, comfort and solace and spiritual reward. And of course, we're, you know, we're, we're now uh, just, this was written almost just before 1800, 1798. And we're only 60 years out from Darwin's origin. And Darwin's origin is going to bring a, a rather different view of, of nature. Um, but I wouldn't say it's a posed view. I mean, Darwin himself felt in many ways, the way Wordsworth felt about being out in the natural world. And his voyage to the Beagle was one of the great uh, uh, experiences of his life. And he spent lots and lots of time in, you know, very challenging and foreboding uh, landscapes there. But he still carried with him this, this sense of, uh, you know, nature as a, as a, as a spiritually... Uh, powerful source of, of well-being and, and sense of beauty. And I don't think Darwin ever lost that in his entire life. And yet, in his science, he, he did something quite different. He was, he was not trying to create, quote, nature, but he was trying to understand living forms and how these forms and the patterns of their existence led to adaptations in the constant change and growth of the evolutionary, uh, evolutionary experience or phenomenon. And uh, that led in quite a different view, in quite a different direction.